It's been said many times in the past that the best gimmicks happen when a wrestler is basically playing themselves with the volume turned up. Just look at guys like Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, or John Cena if you want any evidence of this. Sometimes, though, things get overthought and someone who should be a slam dunk ends up cast in the wrong role, hurting their ability to get over in the process. But what are the biggest examples of this in action? Well, that's exactly what we're going to be looking at today. So join us as we take a deep dive into miscast wrestlers in the wrong role. And if we're starting anywhere, we really should start with the most recent example of someone being in the wrong role on a major wrestling show, as ever since coming back from her sabbatical, Ronda Rousey just hasn't felt quite as special anymore in her role as a weekly competitor. Of course, if you'd have told anyone this a few years ago, they'd have laughed you out of the room, because following a superstar making run in UFC between 2012 and 2016, the baddest woman on the planet was arguably the biggest star in all of sports, male or female. So when she made her long anticipated jump over to WWE full time in early 2018 then, it felt like the most major league signing the company had pulled off in years. And that was because, with Rousey turning out to be pretty good in the ring, and her actual matches being spaced out so they felt special whenever they did happen, for the first time, it was plausible that the women could get the coveted WrestleMania main event spot. Sure, this was also helped by the meteoric rise of Becky Lynch in late 2018, but even taking that into consideration, without having the former UFC bantamweight champion there to draw in more mainstream eyeballs, there was little hope the company would have actually gone on last with an all-women's bout. But they did, and with this proving to be a hit with fans, the feat would be repeated again with Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair two years later. Unfortunately though, by the time they got there, Rousey was already gone, as following her loss to the man at WrestleMania 35, she decided to leave for a while. That said, she would return eventually, this time as a surprise entrant in the 2022 Royal Rumble. But for as big of a moment as this felt initially, the excitement quickly died down as she increasingly began to feel more and more like an afterthought. Not that she wasn't being pushed, of course. No, she'd actually find a lot of success in this second run, with her even defeating Charlotte Flair for the SmackDown Women's title at one point. The problem, though, was that she was being pushed too hard, at least in the sense that she was there every week, something which made her feel more and more like just another face on the roster as time went on. Had she been presented more like a special attraction instead, however, someone who showed up every so often and got a big pop whenever she did, it's likely that aura would have never dissipated. After all, it's a formula which has worked for Brock Lesnar during his second run with the company, as it has with other larger-than-life stars of the past, such as Andre the Giant. And that's brought us to a point where, as it stands, the current plans for WrestleMania don't seem to include the much-anticipated Rousey vs. Becky Lynch singles match, with the rumored reason for this being that the heat has died down too much for it to be worthwhile now. Hell, it's not even clear if Ronda will be on WrestleMania at all at this point, a fact which is mind-boggling if you really think about it. Still, at least she can take solace in the fact that she's not the only sports legend currently on the roster who isn't being used in the way they should be, and we can say this for certain because over on SmackDown, Rey Mysterio doesn't feel as important as he should. Of course, this really is a crime then, because there are few figures more legendary than him who can still go at such a high level. And with many of his old turn of the millennium peers still being given high profile spots on the roster, there really is no excuse for the Lucha star not being put in that position too. Instead of being presented as an icon and someone who can make attraction style appearances whenever a main eventer needs a good opponent to go up against though, Rey has been relegated to basically playing the role of a mid-card journeyman over the last few years. And sure, part of the reason he's played more of a mid-card role during this time is because he wanted to work with his son Dominic and help train him. But there's no reason he couldn't have done this while also being used in a more high profile spot too. Alas though, as it stands, it looks like this will be his role for the remainder of his career, as with many younger fans now seeing him as just another guy, he's lost much of that aura he once had. However, the WWE aren't the only promotion that have had issues putting wrestlers in the right roles, as AEW are far from perfect when it comes to casting performers in the right positions too. And if you want any evidence of this, you only have to look at the booking of Luchasaurus. But wait, we hear you ask. Surely Luchasaurus' role as the tag team partner of Jungle Boy has seen him find a certain degree of success down in Jacksonville. Well, yes, that's true. But ever since he separated from Jack Perry in mid-2022, things have stalled significantly. And that's because rather than just presenting him as the big monster heel right out of the gate, 
Tony Khan first decided to draw things out by having the wrestling dinosaur flip-flop between heel and face multiple times during the lead-up to that September's All Out. How did he do this? Well, by first booking the monster to align himself with Christian Cage, only for him to then shift back to the side of the good guys as he returned to his friend Jungle Boy a few weeks later. Then, once All Out itself came, Luchasaurus pulled a Vince Russo-style swerve when he revealed he and Christian had been in cahoots all along. But while this might have seemed like a decent idea on paper, all it did in execution was water down the big man's character and made him feel less important than he should have been. That said, he can at least take some solace in the fact that he's not the only big monster in AEW who isn't as big of a deal as he should be right now, because while Luchasaurus was at least appearing on TV regularly prior to his recent injury, the same can't be said for Miro. Yes, Miro. Someone who came into WWE in the mid-2010s as Rusev and became an instant smash hit with the fans. And a large part of this was because he was such a physically imposing presence, he hearkened back to the days of the old territory badasses like Harley Race, Dr. Death Steve Williams, or Vader. Unfortunately though, his time in New York would ultimately end with him being treated like little more than a mid-card comedy act. So that was why, when he made the jump to Tony Khan's promotion in September of 2020 and started once again going by his real name of Miro, expectations were high the upstart company could finally use him correctly. Except they didn't for the most part anyway. Now, when Miro first came in, rather than being treated like a dominating heel monster, he'd instead be presented as a Twitch gamer and stablemate to Kip Sabian in Penelope Ford. Luckily then, once that run ended, he'd be booked correctly for a little while as, after finally winning the TNT title from Darby Allin, the Bulgarian brute finally felt like the killer he should have been all along. Sadly though, this wouldn't last either because after losing the same title to Sammy Guevara a few months later, Miro pretty much disappeared from TV, with him only making the odd sporadic appearance since then. And sure, there's been much speculation as to why this is, with many in the know suggesting he and Tony Khan have been unable to agree on a direction for his character going forward. But even if there's nothing big in the cards for him, that doesn't excuse the fact that Miro hasn't been seen on TV at all since June of 2022. So when he does eventually come back then, all the stop-start pushes are no doubt going to make it difficult for him to feel like a big deal once more. Still, he's not the only legit tough guy wrestler who's had to deal with this kind of thing over the years, because back in the late 80s, perhaps the toughest of them all not named Ming was being wildly miscast. Who are we talking about here? Why, Harley Race, of course. Yes, during the 60s, 70s, and even into the early 80s, there was no figure in wrestling more respected than Harley Race. And that's because, as the eight-time NWA World's Heavyweight Champion, he'd carried the industry on his back and represented it with all the honor you'd expect from a man like him. Of course, this included keeping kayfabe alive at all costs, so if anyone ever tried to step up to him in a bar, Race had to make sure he could handle himself and maintain his aura of being the ultimate badass. Luckily then, he was more than able to do so. In fact, such a tough guy was he, it's since been said that he was one of only two men who Andre the Giant legitimately feared. And so with that in mind, you'd think it'd be an easy choice to have him carry on in such a role once he made the jump to WWF in 1986. Instead of booking him as an old school figure who could challenge the likes of Hulk Hogan here though, Race was instead slotted into more of a mid-card role when he was given a crown and named the King of the Ring. But this was long before the King of the Ring was its own separate pay-per-view, so gaining such an honor didn't come with the same sense of glitz and glamour it did during the 90s. And it certainly didn't help to build Race as the ultimate tough guy in the eyes of younger fans either, fans that weren't as familiar with his work in the territories. No, all it did was make him seem like an old man whose time had passed and who didn't have what it took to challenge the real top guys anymore. And sure, it's true that he was getting on in years a little by this point, but he was still more than capable of being a real threat if he'd just been presented as such to the audience. Just imagine the passing of the torch moment which could have happened had he gone up against the Hulkster in a big time pay-per-view match then. Sadly, that's something we'll never see now, just as we'll never see what could have become of another big territory star going up against Hogan a few years later. And no, we're not talking about Ric Flair here, because that one did happen eventually in WCW. What we are talking about instead is the decision to bring Dusty Rhodes into New York in 1989 and, rather than push him as a main event player, present him as a polka dot clad mid-carder, 
Of course, if you have any sense of who Vince McMahon is, though, this one makes a lot more sense. Because always being one to take a shot at his competition, the boss just couldn't help himself from making Rhodes look like a fool upon his debut. But while he might have gotten a laugh out of it at the time, it proved to be an incredibly short-sighted decision in the end, as rather than have a big-time star to add to his roster, all Vince got was a comedy act who never really rose any higher than a tag-team feud with the Macho King and Sensational Sherry. So as the 80s bled into the 90s, Rhodes realized that he'd made a huge mistake and instead returned to his old home of World Championship Wrestling, where he'd once again take on a role as a booker. Had he been booked better though, he'd have never needed to do so, and in exchange for giving the American Dream the treatment he deserved, WWF could have filled up multiple WrestleMania main events by having him go up against the likes of Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. Still, at least this didn't damage the relationship between both sides forever because years later, Dusty would return to WWE in order to take up a role as an occasional on-screen performer and eventual head trainer of their developmental brand, NXT. And as he was doing this, he'd see a lot of very talented names pass through on their way to superstardom, names like Roman Reigns, Sasha Banks, and even his own son, Cody Rhodes. One name who never quite reached those levels, however, is our next subject of the day. But then again, given how much of his career he'd spend in the commentary booth rather than in the ring, it's no surprise Alex Riley never became a star on that level. Of course, for a while, it looked like he might actually achieve his goals of being a top guy, though, because during the early days of his main roster run in 2010, the rookie would partner up with and then eventually feud against The Miz. And with The Miz being a main event player himself at this point, it was expected that being in the ring with him was going to elevate Riley to the next level. Unfortunately, though, sometime around 2011, any momentum he'd been able to build up would stall. And while he's always blamed this on the fact that he apparently pissed off John Cena backstage, it's unclear if Big Match John actually had anything to do with his deep push. What we do know is that from this point onwards, Riley's star would wane, and someone who was once thought to be a superstar in waiting would disappear into the mid-card. Maybe had he enough time to build himself back up then, things could have improved. After all, many a wrestler before him had struggled through rough patches and then come out of the other end even stronger than ever. In the case of Alex Riley, though, he'd choose a different path, one which saw him retire from in-ring competition in 2013 and move over to the commentary booth instead. And while it's unfair to blame a commentator in modern-day WWE for being bad given what they had to work with, it's undeniable that Riley never really shone in the role once he took it up. So perhaps it should be considered a blessing then that, in 2015, he'd returned to being an occasional in-ring competitor over on NXT. Sadly though, a year after this, he'd be released from his contract, leaving us all to wonder what could have been had he not wasted so many years stuck behind a desk. But he's far from the worst example of someone being misused under Vince McMahon's watch as, prior to this in 2001, the boss took one of WCW's biggest stars at Diamond Dallas Page and turned him into nothing but a mid-card act. Yes, just like Dusty Rhodes prior, this was another example of McMahon feeling like he had to put someone from the competition in their place. But there really was no need for him to do that at the turn of the millennium though, as by then, he already owned WCW. Unable to get his ego out of the way, however, the boss took one look at the man who'd gotten so over down south and decided he'd be better served as the secret stalker of The Undertaker's wife. But none of that made any sense because, as any longtime WCW fan knew, DDP was already happily married to Kimberly Page, and he certainly didn't need to get The Undertaker to make him famous at this point, as he'd already won the WCW world title on multiple occasions. Still, despite these facts, Vince McMahon went ahead with the storyline anyway, and unfortunately for everyone involved, it was a story which ultimately buried Dallas so far into the ground he'd never be taken seriously as a main eventer in WWF thereafter. No, rather than get to put on dream matches such as The Rock vs. DDP, People's Champion vs. People's Champion, the WCW stalwart was instead relegated to a mid-card role. So much so, in fact, that once the time for the big winner-takes-all battle between the two companies took place in 2001's Survivor Series, Page wasn't even in the match to represent his home team. But at least he was in a situation where he should have been going up the card rather than down it. After all, it's easier to get people on your side again when you're being underutilized. However, if you're placed into a legendary faction with no real business being there, fans will soon let you know about it, just as they did with Paul Roma when he joined the Four Horsemen.
That's right, the Four Horsemen, wrestling's first supergroup, and to this day, arguably still its best. And if you need any evidence of what makes them so great, you only have to look at the names which have graced the ranks over the years. Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Tully Blanchard, Barry Windham, Sting, Brian Pillman, and Dean Malenko. These are just a few of the people who have at one time or another called themselves a horseman. So when you consider this, it makes it stand out all the more that in May of 1993, Journeyman Territory Act Paul Roma became the newest member of the group. Sure, Roma was a decent enough performer, but even he'd admit he was far from the level required to stand there alongside the likes of the Nature Boy and the Enforcer. No, while he'd been able to make something of a name for himself on TV prior to this as one half of power and glory in the WWF, no one considered him a good enough talent to be in the main event, let alone part of the greatest stable in the industry. So it should come as no surprise that by November of that same year, management had realized this and his run with the stable was over with the whole incident from there being left to fall into the footnotes of history. But what if your biggest failure doesn't get a chance to fall into obscurity? What if it's one of the things people come to associate with you the most? Well, that's a problem the great Kali has had to deal with over the years because, despite initially joining WWE as a monstrous heel in 2005, he's arguably better remembered now for his time working as a comedy giant. Of course, this is a risk every unstoppable heel figure in wrestling has to contend with eventually, though. After all, you can only go undefeated for so long before ultimately some valiant babyface topples you. So when this happens and you're no longer unbeatable, there are a couple of options you have. You can either try to regain your heel heat by mowing through some more people, or you can switch to being a babyface instead. Unfortunately though, in the case of the Great Kali, when he chose the latter option in 2008, it would see him lose his threatening aura altogether. And that was because, despite still being over 7 feet in height, he was now presented as a comedy goof, one who was never going to be taken seriously as a world title contender ever again. But then, this is a shame, as while he was never much of a wrestler, there was arguably still more which could have been done with Kali as a heel monster had he just been given a chance to rehabilitate himself. Hell, he could have even jumped brands and gotten a fresh coat of paint over on Raw for a while, there finding a whole new cast of characters to go up against. In the end though, he'd be stuck playing the wrong role of the smiling hero, just as our next entry for today has been doing ever since moving up to SmackDown in 2022. Who are we talking about this time? Why, Raquel Rodriguez, of course. And to understand why this one has been such a mistake, you only have to look to how much success the Texas-born star had during her time working in NXT. Of course, a big part of the reason for this was that, whether playing the role of the babyface or heel, she was always no-nonsense and always ready to get serious when the situation required. Once she moved up to the blue brand, however, things would change as any edge she had was shaved off when she was instructed to come out to the ring every night smiling and waving to the live crowd. And just as you'd expect then, this didn't exactly make her seem threatening. No, while she's continued to find some level of success on the main roster in spite of this, any lingering aura left over from her developmental days is now long gone. So rather than now come across like a world beater and next top star of the women's division she seemed destined to be, Raquel is quickly becoming yet another faceless good guy lost in the shuffle, one who's in desperate need of a character upgrade so as to save them. That said, there's still time for her to recover, and if she can, there's every possibility she'll be a top star once more. And the same can also be said for at least some of the others we've discussed today too. So hopefully, their current situations will prove to be just a blip in the road, and before long, they can return to what they do best, being the right person in the right role. <laughs>